Seeing how Crisis on Infinite Earths Part 2 is still about Ralla a month away, let's talk about Green Lantern for a change. Similar to Batman Year One, which was Batman's newly reforged origin story after Crisis on Infinite Earths, Green Lantern got one too back when the 80s were about to become the 90s in the form of Emerald Dawn, and its sequel Emerald Dawn 2. And this video won a poll where I asked my audience on what they want me to make next. Both of those stories were then combined when the DC animated original movie universe was to kickstart itself in with Green Lantern First Flight, which I already brought up in my Wonder Woman 2009 review, and those two then ended up equally successful in not getting any sequels. And that then gave me the excuse to take a look at that movie, since it seems to have a source material to compare it to, because I'm going to save Jeff Johns Green Lantern Secret Origins to compare to the Ryan Reynolds movie. When it comes to Emerald Dawn, I went through it with Robert for his Pro Teachers Noob series after collecting the scans for editing this video, meaning that I already had some ideas on the story already, but at this point of the video I can say that the story commentary will be done somewhat differently than usual, like with less narration and more recapping commentary because of how both six issue series are told, and because Jeff John's version is automatically better, although there are some good points that I do acknowledge. The story is also somewhat held back by having the first issue of the story be written by James Owsley, who is better known today as Christopher Priest, with MD Pride doing the art and the rest of it was done by the late Keith Giffen and Gerald Jones. And with that said, let's go over the story they worked on for how Hal Jordan became the first human to be chosen into the Green Lantern Corps. As the first reinvention of Hal Jordan's characterization, Emerald Dawn opens up with his childhood trauma of witnessing the death of his father in a plane accident during an air show, before we jump into the present day where Hal is out drinking with his brothers and friends as the result of having been demoted from being a pilot. After getting an icy glare from his girlfriend Carol Ferris, whose father is his boss, Hal and his party depart from the bar without a designated driver, and their jeep ends up crashing into another car when he is on the wheel trying to dodge a sign. Hal ends up waking up in the hospital, where he is condemned by his standing nurse as a drunk driver, with Carol telling him later that he should be in jail for almost killing his brothers and friends, one of whom, by the way, is still hospitalized. Then, when Hal is trying to focus on his low-paying job and no one is observing him in the flight simulator, his origin story starts to happen when it's taken from the hangar with him inside it, flown through the air, and delivered to the crash alien spacecraft, where the dying Abin Sur passes his Green Lantern ring, uniform and power battery to him. Hal reacts to what he has been given while forgetting to take the power battery with him before the reality hits him, and calls Carol to learn that he is blamed for having stolen the flight simulator, as well as that his brother survived their hospital trip, while his friend Andy has gotten paralyzed as the result of his drunk driving. Hearing this coins, Hal took charge back at the the hospital where Andy is, and while passing the yellow sign that goes him to crash, sorry, the yellow sign that he tried to dodge and so ended up crashing, while he tries to fly through it out of frustration and ends up face against the ground. And that's it with what Christopher Priest wrote, with the rest of the story being written by Keith Giffen and Gerald Jones. After waking up from a flashback dream from his probably last flight, Hal wakes up to hitch a ride back to the hospital where Andy is recovering, and learns that the Green Lantern Ring is not a magical artifact that can cure the sick like Andy with his paralysis. After that failure to fix up his mistake, Hal flies through the clouds where he tries to comprehend his situation, and ends up distracting a jet's flight. He does manage to save the jet and its pilot, only to be chewed up in front of Carol too, since it's one of the Ferris jets, for having caused the incident in the first place. 
This causes Hull, who had figured out to create a mask for himself to hide his identity, to fly away again before realizing that this is a mess he has created for himself, and so decides to take responsibility for his actions by turning himself in. At the closest police station, Hull lets himself be arrested for drunk driving, and while being processed, is forced to hand over the ring to the cops. While Hull is ringless and explaining his situation to his cellmate, the police station is attacked by a large yellow alien character that was only created for this story, and who is ranting about wanting him to know where the Green Lantern is, which so gives Hull a reason to escape from his cell when it's broken into. While his nameless cellmate unintentionally sacrifices himself as a distraction, Hull reaches for his ring among the other confiscated belongings in the police station, but it doesn't make make any difference because the brood is yellow and the green lantern rings don't work against anything yellow. Fortunately by now, his ring has also run out of charge, which causes Hal to lose his uniform and look like a civilian that the brood throws away, and instead goes to track down the energy trail left by the green lantern ring. Hal escapes from the police station and eventually hitches a ride that takes him to the hospital where Andy was held at and is now in ruins as the brute went there because Hal used his ring in there. And then it went to wreak havoc at Ferris Air because Hal was there too as a Green Lantern, which pushes Hal into taking the situation more seriously and return back to Abin Sur's crash ship on foot to get the power battery. Charging the ring causes it to play a message to inform Hal more about the Green Lantern Corps, as well as about how Abin Sur was transporting Legion, the yellow brute, on a ship because it is yellow and caused him to crash land onto Earth as the end result. And then Legion attacks Hal at the ship, in a somewhat one-sided battle because of the yellow weakness, up until Hal decides to think outside of the box and uses his ring to blow up the ship in believing he can take Legion out with the explosion. With that out of the way, Hull next decides to ask his ring if it can take him to meet other Green Lanterns. And while it takes him to meet Tomare in the neighboring space sector 2813, Legion, who was not blown up but instead backed away to see where Hull is going and decides to follow him, in believing that Hull will eventually lead it to planet Oa. Tomare is introduced to Hull in being surprisingly apathetic about Abin Sur's death, and one good instruction slow reader moment later, he then gets more serious in telling Hull that they are both being summoned to Oa. The story is at this point moving at a neck-breaking speed that I can just keep summarizing how Hull is introduced to Salak by Tomare before he is shown the Book of Oa to learn more about the history of the Green Lantern Corps. After that, Hal is told by Tomare that he is to stay on Oa for training and not to pity himself over past mistakes like his DUI, but rather try to be better in going forward while taking responsibility for his actions. That starts with Hal being shown how to send a holographic projection of himself back to Earth so he can pay his respects at Andy's funeral, with only his brother Jack and Carol being aware of his attendance. After that, Hal is introduced to Kilowog for his training, which is shown to be an exhausting exercise for Hal, that he doesn't get to rest and recover from because by the end of that first day, Legion has made its way to Oa. That makes the next issue number 5 have Hal and the other Green Lanterns, like Sinestro as an example, struggling to fight Legion because it is yellow. They try to get around that by throwing dirt at it and with physical attacks, but eventually they end up waking up the Guardians from their nap time, and then the Legion is messed up in a bunch of cables, Hull cuts and grabs them to drag Legion to the marshlands of Oa. Their Legion gets covered in mud, not to be yellow anymore, so Hull gets to go all out on using his ring to beat it up, until the ring's AI tells him to stop being emotional. Not that it stops Hull but eventually Legion starts to beg for its life and sharing its backstory as a hive mind of an extinct alien race that the Guardians forced it to reduce itself into its current form by confining it in its previous form into a world too small to exist in. 
That caused the alien race to reduce themselves into this form, with its only purpose in going forward being to get revenge against the Guardians, to which Hull seems to empathize at first, before reminding Legion that it killed his best friend, which leads to Legion allowing Hull to destroy its containment suite, which then releases what that dead race's last members had been reduced into inside it the containment armor. Now Legion is a gigantic, formless blob coming at the Guardian Citadel again, with the Green Lantern's rings not being able to do much or anything against it, and with the Guardian seemingly ready to cut their losses and abandon Oa. Hull on the other hand decides that Vittu ei pilluilla saatana! and instead flies into the Green Lantern's central power battery, which causes two things to happen. Number one, it charges Hull up with more than enough power to flush Legion off the planet, and number two, well, it unintentionally gave Jeff Chance a great idea how to save Hull's characterization after Emerald Twilight eventually turned him into Parallax. The logistics of how that happened are still unknown to Hull, the other Lanterns, and to the Guardians, who decide to literally take Legion back to where it came from, and hope it will be nice this time. Hull's actions are still recognized for their results, and the Guardians formally declare him as the Green Lantern of Space Sector 2814. After that, Hull returns back to Earth and decides to take responsibility for his actions by turning himself for his DUI, which leads him to be sentenced to spend 90 days in a prison, where the events of Emerald Dawn 2 take place. Because the judge that handles Hull's case wants to make him a warning example for anyone else who thinks that drunk driving is a good idea by making Hull spend his law-abiding punishment of 90 days imprisonment under maximum security. The multiple story-driven conflicts in their start, as Hull when moved to the penitentiary, stopped one more robbery as Green Lantern to get himself enemies to do time with. Then to keep his ring from being confiscated, Hull has to let himself be strip-searched, which gains him a certain reputation before his cellmate gets stabbed in the back. Luckily, Hull gets Guy Gardner as his public defender, so his sentence doesn't end up getting increased. Unfortunately, due to the losses Oa suffered in part 1, the Guardians decide to start sharpening their newest recruits and decide to send Sinestro to continue Hull's training. The last time I properly talked about Sinestro was in my Injustice Year 2 video 3 years ago, so if you have seen it, then you can probably see where this is going. The premise of Emerald Dawn 2 is meant to be Sinestro's fall from grace to villainy origin story, similar how Emerald Dawn 1 was meant to be Hull's origin story in becoming a Green Lantern. That means that in the middle of his prison sentence, the nights when he can be absent from there, Hull is taken into being trained with Sinestro on how to use his Green Lantern ring and how to deal with the alien politics as an intergalactic peace officer. In the middle of all that, Hull also gets a gentleman thief named Willy as his cellmate, who agreed to keep Hull's secret while tempted to take his Green Lantern ring, but ultimately didn't in probably realizing that patience would help serving out his sentence easier. Unfortunately, Willy ended up antagonizing that jewelry store thief who was also sent to the same prison, and who then recognizes Hull to be the Green Lantern when Hull use the same banter line What would your mama think if she could see you now? on him while defending Willy. So, on one night before Hal was taken by Sinestro for more training, Willy heard the robber planning to try steal his ring and got shivved for having heard too much. Luckily and unfortunately, while they planned to steal his ring, Sinestro had brought Hal to his homeworld of Korugar, where Sinestro had been overdoing his duties and was seen as a tyrant ruling over them by the locals. Especially by Katmatui, who was working with a council that Hal and Sinestro had met earlier during his training and antagonized them. 
During that chaos, Hal called for reinforcements from the corpse, which Sinestro did not approve in probably subconsciously realizing how bad this situation on Korugar would look onto him, and managed to convince Hal that they need to flee before those reinforcements arrive. And then they arrive to be repelled by the locals while also recognizing that Sinestro's banners were spread all around the planet. Tomare, in leading that backup crew, recognized what was going on in Korugar and reported this back to the Guardians, who decided to respond by sending these prototype Alpha Lanterns after Hal and Sinestro. Around this same time on Earth, the robber decided to make his move with a group of other prisoners, and as Hal was not there with his ring, they went to hold Willy and the visiting guy hostage in demanding to get the ring and ultimately had started a prison riot by the time Hal and Sinestro returned. To keep Sinestro from standing out as a magenta-skinned alien, he used his ring to disguise himself as Willy, and sent the real Willy away before they went to rescue Guy. By Hal letting the robber, DID HE SERIOUSLY NOT HAVE A NAME IN THIS COMIC?! Take his ring so Sinestro could just as soon get it back to him. And the guy beat up the robber in showing some of his future aggressive personality, and then those proto Alpha Lanterns showed up. Their appearance caused Sinestro to flee while the rioting prisoners were pacified enough for Hal to become a Green Lantern, to put them back into their cells, establish himself to still be imprisoned, and then be recalled to Oa by the time the proto Alpha Lanterns had caught Sinestro and brought him to Oa for his trial. And we can get Guess how that ended up. Hal's testimony from his training, coupled with what Tomares group saw on Korugar, and Kat Matui being brought in as a witness on how Sinestro had been ruling over them, coupled with Sinestro's ranting and inability to recognize his own mistakes, led to the Guardians banishing him to the antimatter universe of Quard. With Sinestro banished, Tomare recommended Kat Matui as Sinestro's replacement, and Hal is sent back to Earth where he finishes off his prison sentence, and is then released for either his brother Jack and Carol, or his sister-in-law, to pick up. Either way, Hull is eventually given back his job as a pilot back at Ferris Air, where he manages to build back his reputation, and even gets the courage to fly planes without having his ring on to make it easier. The end. Okay, this comic series was a mixed bag of good ideas that were not executed well enough. Although to be fair, I would probably look at it with more favorably if Jeff Johns' Green Lantern Secret Origin did not exist to look better next to it. The first issue by Christopher Priest starts the story from a very human perspective, with Hal being close to the rock bottom before he ends up down there before getting the Green Lantern ring, and his story arc over the two issued series is to learn how to take responsibility for his actions while also busy with Green Lantern stuff. It's barely done well in the first story, as it needs to have a new, random villain who caused Abin Sur's death to be taken out as the main threat, while the second story works somewhat better while also trying to tell how Sinestro became a villain, while also being established as Hal's mentor without properly justifying why someone like Sinestro would have ever been chosen as a Green Lantern. I do not. I hate pre-Jeff John Sinestro. I hate him because of how transparently evil he is. It's like Jeff John's looked at like Okay, either the Guardians are the biggest idiots in the world, which they can be, or Sinestro, for Sinestro to be considered the greatest Green Lantern, he had to have been a good guy for the ring to choose him. Why would the ring make a mistake? So this is a case where they actually do humanize him. Just not enough. Mm. Yeah, first attempt, first draft version. That yeah, then that Jeff yeah. Johns would then improve on. Exactly, but again, on its own, back in post-crisis, this was a game changer. This was phenomenal story. I mean, a lot of stuff. Deal with the drunk driving, him going to jail. How this was done with Sinestro was a good step forward. It's just that Sinestro still ought to be... Not to mention, the first story has one of the other Green Lanterns appearing to be Katma Tui before she is even made a Green Lantern. 
Ben Art wise the story is serviceable with MD Pride. But otherwise Emerald Dawn is better to be seen as the first attempt to replicate the year one story for Green Lantern after a crisis on Infinite Earths happened. And we might as well cherry pick the good parts out of it while acknowledging Jeff Johns Green Lantern Secret Origin as the superior remake. I'll talk more about that comic in comparing it to the 2011 Ryan Reynolds movie, but before that, let's see how Green Lantern First Flight stands on its own and while having just Emerald Dawn to work as its source material. Nyt saatte piiskaa. Meikäväinen teidät käsi laukua viiskaa. You know what I realized while watching this movie? At any point during the comic, either series, the Green Lantern Oath was not spoken by any character. Hal was not even taught it at the end of the first series after Legion was defeated, and Sinestro or Kilowog never recited it to him during his training. And this movie doesn't do any better except by bare minimum by having it be spoken in the end. In brightest day, in, in brightest night, night. No evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power. Green Lantern Flight! And in the beginning they rush through Hal's origin story in how he gets his ring with Abin Sur dying in the crash landing of a ship. As for Hal's characterization, it's pretty much on the same level as with Steve Trevor in the 2009 Wonder Woman movie, based on his dialogue with Carol Ferris in the first scene. Carol, it's quite a setup here. All those stars, the blue water. Reminds me of that night in Cabo. Remember the restaurant? Hal, stay on the flight. A lot of sangria that night. Boy, could you put it away. Hal. I don't know how we ever okay. made it back to the hotel. Hal, you're at 91,400 feet. And then after that, Abin Sur ship blows up. Hal flies the simulator he was dragged away in back with everyone seeing it, while also pretending he was inside the whole time without knowing what happened. And then we get to when the other Green Lanterns come for Hal. Kilowog, Tomare, Boudica and Sinestro to be specific. And for some reason, the movie has the first to be in denial of Abin Sur's ring having chosen Hal next. At this point I should probably acknowledge that Green Lantern First Flight is not an adaptation, but rather an original story that took influence from Emerald Dawn's both series, but that does not excuse going off the script when it comes to how the Green Lanterns are supposed to work. Because changes like this are yet an another example of the story moving the characters instead of the characters moving the story. And then there is the fact that apparently the filmmakers have said that they wanted Green Lantern First Flight to be more inspired by the training day movie, with Sinestro being Denzel Washington's character and Hal being Ethan Hawke. I see that both as a blessing and as a curse for giving the voice cast, such as Christopher Meloni as Hal and Victor Garber as Sinestro, have a clear idea on what to base their performances on, but this also changed their characterizations into complete strangers from who they were supposed to be portraying. First, let's talk about how Hal does not exactly have a character arc in this movie, and he is more or less along for the ride as a rookie with the other Green Lanterns. The only characterization he got was from the opening few minutes before all of that is underlined with the corpse business. Hal is not even given any boot camp training as a new recruit in learning how to use his ring, because he is made to know how it works to create different different constructs just from getting it. What is even the point of having Kilowog in this movie? 
Later during it, we actually get a moment where Hal rescues Kilowog when they are going through a Mass Effect warp relay. And it probably would have been a good moment between the two if Kilowog had taught him how to do that. And then with Sinestro, we never get to see him on Korugar or how he was treating his people in there. As this movie wanted to be like Training Day, Sinestro is portrayed similarly as a corrupt cop like Alonzo Harris, who knows he is working against what being a Green Lantern is supposed to be. Look at the universe the Guardians have created. We have the greatest power in the cosmos, and what have they made us? Garbage collectors. We pick up the trash. A thief here, a killer there. Scum, dirt, filth. There's no end to it. But there could be. It's my dream that one day all this rot will be wiped away. A new order will prevail. One that will end the chaos, but it won't be built by the faint of heart. You got soft on me back there, Earth boy, and that I will not tolerate. You lied to the Guardians. I've lied to everyone. I've had to. Why? Think about it. How did Kanjaro know exactly where to find the yellow element? How was Abansur killed so quickly? Are you saying there's a traitor? Of course. Why do you think I wanted to work with Earthboy? At least I could be sure he was clean. You should have told the Guardians. In due time. Let's get the yellow element first, Kilowog. Then we'll all be heroes. Take off your ring. <laughs> Kanjaro is dead. I was his partner. He told me to come to Quard, to pick the weapon up here. He paid for it, and now it's mine. Yes, Scanthet. A new command is at hand. A new authority. How dare you! It's an affront to a m Shut your mouth, you stupid little troll! You're nothing but a clutch of bickering old biddies, ineffectual and obstructionist. In a galaxy screaming for order, you have cast a deaf ear. But all that ends now. As demigods bound by your word, all of you are going to pledge your undying allegiance to me. Future Pika here, I'm in the middle of editing this video. I just realized that, okay, Sinestro does have somewhat same-ish kind of characterization as in Emerald Dawn 2, in how he was obsessed about control. But otherwise, when it comes to him not liking the Guardians, it, that's true, Sinestro does not like the Guardians. This might be the Jeff Johns influence that came after it during his run, but Sinestro has been characterized is still respects what the Green Lantern Corp stands for. He doesn't like the Guardians, but he respects the Corp. Okay, I'm back to what I wrote previously. And that along with the rewritten lore in how the Green Lantern Corp central power battery works also has Sinestro characterized as if this movie was meant to be a prequel to the Sinestro Corp's war. As which it already fails as by lacking key players, characters and elements needed to set it up. Such as Parallax and Ion, who have been reduced from being the avatars of fear and willpower into video game energy shards. And speaking of those shards, the very existence of the yellow one is said in the movie to be the reason why the Green Lantern rings do not work against yellow. After we have had multiple scenes showing how the rings have next to no problem against yellow walls, yellow water and a yellow environment altogether. And then there is Green Lantern Boudica, who in the main continuity was loyal to the corpse all the way to being promoted into becoming an Alpha Lantern, the closest thing to an internal affairs officer in the corpse, who was turned into Sinestro's co-conspirator as an another dirty cop, and had she survived, would probably have been turned into another member of the Sinestro corpse. Again, yes, this is not an adaptation of Emerald Dawn, but it is working out of it as a similar story in retelling Hal Jordan's origin story as a Green Lantern with Sinestro's downfall, meaning that it should acknowledge the important parts of an origin story in helping us to understand how we go from point A to point D without skipping points B and C. 
So, we never see Hal being trained after getting his ring. We never see how Sinestro got to this point. We do see them confront and fight each other in a mandated climax, in which Hal goes inside the central power battery and is turned into something close to Ion like in Emerald Dawn 1. And then, whatever setup there probably could have been for that cancelled Sinestro Corps war movie, are brushed aside when Hal destroys the yellow power battery, and Kilovog destroys Sinestro's yellow ring. The movie also doesn't show what the Guardians are going to do to Sinestro after he is defeated, as this movie rewrites Quard into being a planet on Space Sector 324, instead of being in the Antimatter universe. Where is the yellow element? They are literally called the Weaponers of Quard. So, why not just call, say it that? With the weaponers of Quard. Sector 324. Very good. Can you be more three, specific? 342. But Quard is in the antimatter universe. Quard. Okay, this was never going to be a good adaptation or even an inspired adaptation as an original story. But ultimately, it was just a bad movie that has not aged well. It could probably be accurately compared to Emerald Dawn in that aspect where Jeff Johns' run just makes it look bad and outdated. And it is an another shame when looking at the voice cast we had with Christopher Meloni voicing a Hal Jordan who didn't have a character arc to go through, Victor Garber voicing a Sinestro who could have had much better material to work with in showing what kind of good Green Lantern he was before his fall, Michael Madsen as Kilowog who talks about training new recruits. Allow me to take the human under my wing. Test him out. See what he's made of. That's my job. But is never shown doing that. And then there is the animation budget that could have been used for a better story than what this movie had. Like look at how detailed the Green Lantern rings are along with this suit up sequence. No wonder this movie didn't end up selling well enough to get a sequel. The wasted potential with the cast and production value with the brush story didn't make it look good enough to be followed up with any kind of story. Okay, I suppose I will be working on getting the funeral for a friend video done next, before I really need to start focusing on Crisis on Infinite Earths Part 2's release. And somewhere between them and the reign of Superman, I'll do a video on how Green Lantern's secret origin was everything that the 2011 movie should have been. Until I get one of those videos done, remember to like this video, comment what you have to say about these two Green Lantern stories, share this video for more people to see it, and subscribe to my channel for those upcoming videos. Also, ding the bell to be alerted for when I will be doing gameplay streams for a chance to chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.